Jesus wrote as the Spirit elsewhere. Uh, just quickly here, searches hearts and in. So now Jesus, as the Spirit, he pours out the Spirit. No wonder Satan hates humans. He's not a God, demigod, angel, man, whatever. No, he's he was a human being, submitted himself to his God. And look at this. God, through him, pours out the Spirit. Those are the verses. He gave gifts to men, Ephesians 4. That's something God did. He dwells in you. Obviously, God dwells in you. But guess who else dwells in you? And Sarah pointed out the very, that the biblical trinity. Mm -hmm. Again, the, there is a biblical trinity, which is right. Ben Witherington, a Trinitarian, by the way, uh, as you might have noticed by now, we are not Trinitarians. We are what they call biblical Unitarians. Uh, he's got a, a book called John's Wisdom, a commentary on the fourth gospel. I found this interesting, what he has to say here. It is at this point that we remember the language of agency that appears over and over again in this gospel and is applied to Jesus. Here the same sort of language is applied to the Spirit, and it will in somewhat similar fashion be applied to the disciples as Jesus' missionaries. If we examine all the passages in the farewell discourse in which the Spirit is referred to, we see that the Spirit has in the main a threefold task. One, to indwell the believer and convey the divine presence and peace, including Jesus' presence to the believer. Two, to teach the believer and to guide the believer into all truth and to testify to the believer about and on behalf of Jesus. Three, to enable the disciples to testify about Jesus to the world and by means of the Spirit's guidance and power, convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. The language of agency is used quite clearly of the Spirit <coughs> and of Jesus in 16. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So that's an inter I found that an interesting section of uh, the rest is horribly <laughs> misguided, I believe. I like the uh, phrase here, by means of the Spirit. That, that's what we're talking about here. By means of the Spirit, Jesus now is identified with the Spirit as Paracletos and as the Spirit itself, as we saw in 2 Corinthians. So summary, Holy Spirit is not a third person of a three-in-one God, nor just an impersonal force or power. Again, check your history. Don't believe me, but you'll see the, the gap in Trinitarianism with Nicaea and 381, and then eventually 451 really is the one that gave us the Trinity. Uh, believers in God, this is an incredible quote here. Believers in God as a single person, God the Father, were at the beginning of the third century still forming the large majority. Guess what that quote is from? Uh, the term parakletos can mean, depending on the context, helper, comforter, advocate, or counselor. Literally, one who is called alongside someone else to help them. Jesus is identified with the Holy Spirit as parakletos, as we saw in the first verse, 1 John 2, 1. 1 John 2, 1 is your key verse there. Because we saw why Paul uh, tells us because he has become the life-giving spirit. He became that. He, he hinted towards that. That's what he's saying in John 14 and John 16. He's hinting at the change that's about to come, starting at Pentecost, by the way. So in 14, remember, you have two things going. Parousia, I'm going. I'm going to prepare a place, and I'll come back. I'll come back. Not... I'm preparing a place so you can go up to heaven when you die and so blah, blah, blah. No, he'll come back for a reason. So because of a what I call new post-resurrection state or status. Mm -hmm. Lastly, uh, Jesus talks, prophesies about himself in the third person. Uh, the alos parakletos, another of the same kind. Remember, alos of the same kind, what kind? The spirit. 